Left. Left or right? Left. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Jason G7OCD to talk about his work with the standalone MPEG4 uh, encoder and modulator. Yeah, thanks. Um, I've got 40 minutes on the clock here, but I'm not going to talk for probably only half that, which um, I'm sure will go down well, because I think we're running a bit late. Um, this talk isn't really designed to be um, drill massively into technical stuff. I will touch um, on a few more in-depth parts as, as we go through, but it's, it's more of a, an experience talk. And um, so, yeah, G7 OCD, um, got licensed when I was at college. Um, my interests started off with VHF direction finding, uh, packet radio, and a bit of fast scan an analog TV. Um, I got introduced really more to the digital TV through uh, a project I did at work. Um, uh, but I'm not here to talk about that project uh, today. But it did have um, quite a lot of sort of the uh, commercial technologies in there that we used. And uh, over the course of a couple of years, I actually realised, why aren't we doing this in the amateur space? It's, it's not that difficult. So I took a lot of the stuff that I'd picked up uh, in the office, um, took that learning home, and uh, I designed uh, a USB-based DVBS modulator. Um, we heard uh, Charles's talk this morning, and um, it's probably worth just uh, just giving a bit more detail there of what I attempted to do and how it sort of compares with what Charles did. Um, my plan was to put all of the all of the transport stream co coding in there, the SI, null, uh, packet insertion, all of that into the FPGA. Um, and then the upload mechanism for that to be your raw MPEG packets and they could, um, the video packets, and they could come either from uh, down the USB port and then providing a migration path uh, to be able to take that USB port off and connect a, um, a standalone video coder. And if you look at some of the other um, amateur uh, digi projects out there, they're often split that way. There's a board there that does some video encoding, and then there's a ribbon cable which is transferring the uh, just the video stream across, and then there's a separate bit with the, the channel coding. Um, and it was it was a lot to put in a, an FPGA, um, but it was I think it was uh, at the time I thought it was the right place. Um, so the project slowed down quite a lot, um, and uh, DigiLight uh, appeared on the scene, and I think I'll concede at this point the uh, the dimension of the FPGA I was intending to use was. Uh, quite large. Um, I was going to put the cost up to sort of probably around the 100 to 150 pounds region. Um, and uh, I think where DigiLight has really won is being able to keep those costs to uh, you know an ab absolute minimum. Um, but both my uh, solution, the DigiLight solution, and what Charles is working on at the moment. Um, which, by the way, I didn't know what you were going to present this morning, so it's very interesting. They all require, uh, you know, a full-blown computer to to, um, to do that front-end video capture bit. Um, so when I realised that DigiLight was out there and I'd got my design, but I probably still had more space on the FPGA, you know, I thought, well, you know, what could I do more? What, how could I justify having this FPGA there and the increased cost? Um, so can I put the video coding bit into the FPGA as well? Uh, this is the reason that uh, my project slowed down. Two of them, actually. 
<laughs> and they're both as expensive as each other. <laughs> anyway. Um, I think I concluded that no, putting the uh, video coding part into the FPGA is not the right way to, to go. I found that uh, most MPEG-2 encoding ICs um, are effectively microprocessors with a fixed program. So they just start up immediately start doing video coding, but they are effectively microprocessors um, with their program basically permanently burnt in that all you will do from the day you switch on is code video. Um, and that's why you see uh, some of these commercial video coders, you know, you can put your finger on, that doesn't feel too warm. But then when you try and do the same coding on your desktop PC, you know, you've got a massive great heat sink on there. Uh, it's not anywhere near as optimised. Um, now, I'm not quite sure why this push for um, implementing hardware coders has occurred in this way. I think it may be that the uh, a lot of the original MPEG reference implementations were written as C code that came out of the universities. Um, and the only way that they thought about the algorithms was to have large amounts of memory available and to do sequential processing, which is really at odds with the FPGA way. Um, so upon a lot of searching, I found that almost all digital video compression algorithms are optimised for... Um, general microprocessors um, and not raw logic devices, which is what you've got available in an FPGA. Now, uh, Charles mentioned FPGAs this morning. Um, for anyone who's not entirely sure what one is, it's basically like um, a big box of Lego, except th these Legos are um, logic gates, and you can plug them together any way you want. And you can re... You can, uh, when you power down, effectively, you've broken your Lego apart, and every time you power it on, you put all the blocks back together. Um, but it's not like um, a microprocessor where you're limited to the same instructions. A microprocessor, you switch it on, it waits for its first instruction, and uh, it has a sort of a limited language. FPGA is far more flexible than that. In fact, an FPGA in some regards is a sort of a, a superset because you can um, write a microprocessor which will sit inside an FPGA. And that's effectively what they did with uh, a port of uh, FFmpeg to FPGA. They effectively put a microprocessor inside the FPGA. So we're back at the same, the same kind of thing. We're back with microprocessors. But it still leaves the question, even if I couldn't uh, use the, the investment of the design I'd done with, um, with the FPGA, is there, a, is there a better way than using a full-blown PC? So I sort of went through a process of thinking, well, what would I want out of this? Um, and at the back of my mind, there's DigiLight and people, how do they operate with it? Well, they're sitting there with the boards connected to a PC or a netbook on where they're going. There's lots of people going out doing portable activity. Um, so how can we optimise all of these things? So keep cost down, make it smaller so it doesn't take over the whole shack. So I've got too many PCs in my shack. There should be more, less PCs and more radio and, or more test equipment if I could afford it. Um, low power. Uh, during the summer, my shack cooks in the sun. I don't want any more heat generators in there running all day. Um, and it'd be really nice if I could go out portable or even do some maritime mobile digital TV. Um, another better would be, you know, can we do HD? Again, without sort of you know, creating loads of carbon emissions. <laughs> Um, the X264 library, which is the component within FFmpeg, which uh, does the H264 encoding. Um, you, know, you give that uh, 1080 signal YUV to compress, 
and that will test even the uh, most powerful desktops. Um, so, you know, there's a problem there. And um, capture interfaces. So we've got, um, we're at the moment, we're using um, you know, domestic capture cards. Um, they're okay, but we're limited to sort of composite or S-video input. Um, I think s now we're starting to see some with some better quality inputs than that. Um, and they're not going to be around forever because now analog TV, commercial analog TV is gone. They're not going to make these PVR cards which can capture the analog uh, TV and compress it to digital. You know, they're, they're a, a need of the past, really. So I went looking for devices that we could use to compress video. Um, Several of the uh, amateur style boards have got the Fujitsu MPEG-2 encoder. The PC solutions, like the ones that uh, most people use with the DigiLite, they use the Connexent series of um, processors. Now, not entirely sure what's inside them, but um, I'm fairly sure that the Fujitsu is effectively a Spark processor running probably an optimised version of the original uh, MPEG reference code. Can't be sure, but I've got quite a bit of evidence to, to suggest that's the case. And I suspect the connection to stuff under the hood is very similar as well. There are H.264 um, cores available. And when I say core, I mean this is a piece of um, code that you can license from a company and put it into, onto your FPGA. Um, they're too expensive to license for our amateur purposes, so I'm not going to even consider those, really. Um, there's this interesting device, a uh, Maxim MG3500, which is in uh, that, or its uh, baby brother, are in the... Um, which one's the... How do I get a laser on this? Green one, is it? Yeah. Um, yeah, this thing down here is um, is is an interesting stick. You plug that in the, into the USB on the side of your laptop, and it basically takes your raw video, sends it to it, where it crushes it down into H.264, and then sends it back to the PC. Um, nice, but you still need to plug it into a PC. Um, and these uh, Blackmagic and Elgato sticks have... S um, have these devices in, but unfortunately, there's only Mac software and um, available. And um, there, there is LibCrusher 264, which is an abandoned open source project to try and get those to work under Linux. So there's a, some possibility there of using that. Um, you can pay big bucks and buy professional kit from Blackmagic Design or someone like that. Now, uh, they will support non-Mac, um, but their software is sort of pretty closed and the result gets just bunged to a file, so it's not really that much good for them putting into uh, downstream processing in a real-time TV scenario. Um, just going back to the Connexent devices, this thing here is an interesting device. It's a... Uh, a mini PCI card. So this is a type of PCI card that goes inside a laptop. And um, it's des designed to go into, um, I think it was a Compaq. I can't remember. The, the brand is Cosimo, which I think is a co like a Compaq brand name. Um, and down this end here, you've got a composite video input. And the, when you put this thing inside this compact laptop, the ribbon cable goes to the side where you have a composite video input. So you have a phono socket. And then on this side, there's a Connexon MPEG-2 compressor. And um, it basically acts as a, a capture card to go in, in, into a laptop. I didn't even know these things existed before I started looking. I thought that uh, hardware MPEG compressors were for the realm of desktop PCs. While we're talking about the Connexent stuff, 
Um, I thought, what's happened here? That's supposed to have automatically started playing. No. Is he round? No, he's done a runner, is he? Right. I'm going to abandon his um, slick PowerPoint presentation and put my stick back in there because they're still on here. This is, um, is going to play it. I think it might actually be a blank bit at the beginning. Right, this is um, this is from a pattern generator, and I captured this using a PVR two hundred and fifty. Um, it's about a megabit a second, um, and I'd just like to bring it to people's attention. Just pay attention to the um, to the resolution up here. It probably doesn't show very well on this projector screen. And just compare that to the um, exactly the same pattern generator connected to the PVR 150. So when people are using these things for Digilight, and I, I've, I've got a box full of 150s and 250s, and they're all, all the 150s are the same, and all the 250s are the same. This is a repeatable measurement. The input bandwidth on the 150s is absolutely dire, so I would encourage you, to, if you're out shopping for one, to have a look for the, um, for the 250s. The 350s are just as good as the 250s. Is that Philips generator? Sorry? Uh, yes. And out of, out of interest, this is what I got out of a 1300. <laughs> and I don't know why it does that. And that was by... Um, Okay, back to the main then. That was those three. So. Right, so on the previous slide, I, I, I forgot to mention it, but I also came across uh, Texas Instruments' um, portfolio of digital signal processors. Um, now, these are quite interesting things. They're very much like the Broadcom uh, sock that's on a Raspberry Pi. Um, they consist of um, an ARM core. Um, this particular version that I've got the data sheet up for is an ARM V9, but they've also got ARM Cortex A8. Um, and a dedicated... Um, video compressor DSP. So that's a DSP and an ARM core inside the same chip. Now, based on what we heard earlier, um, it sounds like Pi Foundation are going to prod Broadcom up into opening something like that, which is currently unavailable and undeclared to the community. The nice thing about the TI stuff is all the data sheets are there, open and available for people to download without signing any NDAs. And um, I'm just going to keep buying these until Broadcom either go bust or change their business model. Um, this, is, this is a better way for the amateur community to be able to work. We can actually develop what we want. The specifications for how to use this are available should we want to write our own code. Um, TI have been kind enough to be able to uh, publish a set of binary blobs that you can just load on there and take for granted. They're not open source, 
Um, but if you want to do your own open source alternative, you can. So I thought, well, what, other, what devices can we actually find that will fit, that actually have these sorts of things in? Why hasn't that faded out completely? Sorry about that. It's supposed to have completely disappeared. Um, yeah, we've got uh, the Beagle board, um, which the uh, DSP is capable of doing uh, compression up to uh, sort of power power resolutions. Um, BeagleBoard XM, which has um, an improved uh, clock speed, 800 megahertz DSP rather than the 520 megahertz DSP. Uh, that'll do 720p, but it's a bit more expensive. And also there's this Leopard board, which is an interesting beast because it's, um, it's actually a slightly older ARM core and slower, uh, but it will actually do, oops, a bit of typo there, 1080 um, and higher. In fact, it will go up to about about 50% bigger in both dimensions, which is quite impressive. Um, and these uh, sort of smallish boards, um, about three inches square. Got one outside if anyone wants to come over and look at it later. Um, there's this new processor which is out, which has got um, a 1.2 gigahertz ARM, 600 meg um, DSP, and then some extra video code units as well um, and that's claiming it's going to do like two or three simultaneous 1080 streams um, don't know what the price is going to look like on that um, but the thing that really grabbed my attention was this leopard board so there's a leopard board um, this side here you've got a network interface not sure if that's going to be much use for us. Um, this side, uh, you've got a, an LCD or DVI output interface. Um, not sure that I really want that for an encoder board, but it's there if I want to use it. Um, this is an interesting thing. There's a camera module interface. So that will either take two serial streams from um, webcam CCDs, um, or it will take a 12-bit parallel stream with horizontal and vertical sync. And that's, that's configurable. Um, there's a nice debug interface here. So if you start flashing the board and get it wrong, you can recover. Um, you can boot your operating system from mem memory card, which is sort of, again, if you get it wrong, you can just swap the card out. So it's a nice recovery thing. Um, and it's got loads of flash and memory on board and by default there are images available to boot this thing straight into Linux a bit like uh, Raspberry Pi so I started looking at um, input and output options for this how could I actually use this as a as a compressor um, Leopard board two, two, two off the shelf modules this one here which takes a uh, component in um, it'll work in RGB or YUV mode um, and the frequencies can either be uh, broadcast type frequencies or it will also take um, PC type frequencies as well um, and then there's um, composite video input um, both have got um, they're both basically analog to digital converters with some extra glue stuff um, I also noticed uh, this device analog devices device and that can do um, RGB um, digitization, but it will also convert HDMI into a, a, a similar uh, format. And it's actually got both interfaces on there. You can switch between the two. Um, so I'm running with um, this device, and there's no off-the-shelf board available. Um, and I'm currently um, about to start soldering up um, one of those onto onto a PCB that I've done that will fit onto that cam camera interface. Um, so output, we need to um, we need to work out how we can get some uh, some modulated signal out of this. Um, and uh, it's got a, a nice high speed serial port uh, which will be uh, plenty fast enough to clock our I and Q samples out. 
um, it's also quite low usage for the CPU. So how does it all glue, to glue together? So this is the uh, camera interface module. So this bit's been um, taken out the data sheet from TI data sheet. So uh, um, here and all down this side, you've got your inputs and you can use all of these together as a 12-bit parallel interface, or you can use them in two groups with this routing to go into a sort of a, a, a serializer, deserializer, sorry. Um, and then basically there's um, an interface here which will then stuff that data straight into memory. So it's sort of your video data arrives in memory without you having to really do much processing at all. It's all hands off as far as the CPU load's concerned. Um, yeah, so it's got this built-in DSP module. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details of this, but it's got this connect down the bot bottom here, and there's interrupts from the peripheral. So what happens is some data arrives from the camera interface module into, into memory. And this DSP can actually go and pick that YUV or RGB information straight out of memory without the processor even getting involved. So the ARM core so far still hasn't done anything. So what are we going to use the ARM core for? Well, we can, um, we can format up the elementary stream. So we've got these raw video frames they're going to need. Um, building up into packets, we're going to need to um, put all the system information packets in. Uh, we're going to need to do time stamping and all those things. And the channel coding. So we're already doing this with DigiLight, so we will uh, do all the forward error correction and puncturing and all that, and there's going to be plenty of horsepower on the, on the arm to do that. And the code's pretty much already written. And then it's a case of um, pushing it out of the system. Now, this is one wacky idea. I thought, well, what could we use to get a, a, ni a nice output in before I settled on using the serial ports? And um, this is the uh, video encoder system, which is actually designed, uh, there's a CVBS output, um, and then there's a separate Chroma output, so you can use the pair together. You can, t you, can t uh, you can route it so you get separate chrominance and luminance all combined as a, as a composite. Um, and I sort of wanted to keep the component count to this to an absolute minimum. And I thought, well, these are nice 10-bit 10-bit digital to analog converters. And remember, our chrominant signal signal is uh, two color different signals in quadrature. And actually, what we want from a QPSK modulation is two signals in quadrature. So, can I take this quadrature modulator, taking the two color different signals and putting it onto a 3.8 meg carrier? Can I use that to create a 3.8 meg RF carrier, one megahertz wide, with a megabit signal in, by putting some weirdy things in there? So if you plug the composite video into an analog TV, it just looks like mush. But actually, what's coming out is a QPSK signal on 3.58 megs. I'm not sure if it's doable because of some of the fixed things and. Um, some of the blanking and clamping stuff and that's, that sort of thing. Um, but I'm still debating it. I've, I've got to read more data sheets, but it is a possibility. And also, uh, being only 3.5 megs out, if you're going to then mix that up, um, you're going to have to have some fairly interesting filtering because your sort of carrier frequency is quite, you know, not much higher than your bandwidth. <laughs> so... Uh, currently, I'm going to go with this high-speed uh, serial port. It's got a 5K built-in um, buffer. So when um, frames, tr uh, transport frames or channel-coded frames are ready, they'll go into the 5K buffer, and this thing will automatically clock them out. And um, with a little bit of external hardware, we'll be able to put this into one of the standard IQ modulator boards that we're using, a bit, uh, like we are with the, the DigiLite. So an update on progress. Um, we've got the capture stuff uh, work in a demonstrable, workable form. It's not my own work. It's mostly sort of the demo code that should get shipped with the boards. Uh, HDMI input board schematics done. Um, yeah, 
a bit further than ready to etch, about ready to solder now. Um, my, so my samples from analogue devices haven't arrived yet, but they should be here next week. Uh, the compression codec going through the DSP, that's working again. I don't claim any major effort to that, but I have most of the demos are to actually show something on the screen working, and I'm taking that all, all out, so it, it, it just boots and starts doing stuff in the background. So there has been some work done there. Uh, DVB formatting done, again, I stand on the shoulders of others. Uh, and the adapter to IQ modulator, I've got a schematic basically done, but there's no PCB layout yet. Um, so some end-to-end -end testing. If anyone's interested in getting involved with me on this project, um, I'd rather not sort of get 90% of the way through like I did with my USB DVBS modulator um, and then find, find my work gets preempted by another group of people doing something completely different. I'd rather work with people on this. Um, I, will the, I will issue the code to the community par partly because um, you know, I'll have to because I'd be standing on other people's work and uh, GPL issues and things. Um, partly because um, I'm not actually that interested in maintaining the software. Um, I just like to, um, you know, get the thing out there and working, and um, probably help getting some boards manufactured. Um, and I and I'll be committing to do that, getting the HDMI board out there available, because um, even if people don't want to use them for uh, DATV, other people will want to use them for. HDMI input for you know web streamers and things like that using the Ethernet as an output. Um, I think I think there'll be a, a sort of a quite a big demand for those. Um, yeah, finally, um, I'm in discussion uh, with one of my uh, chums who's been helping out doing some of the flight software for the FunCube satellite. Um, that's pretty much done and dusted now. Um, so, so what other challenge can I give to him? He's shown an interest in taking some of the uh, Linux sound modem uh, work and um, turning that into a narrow band sort of 100 to 200 kilobits uh, modem um, using the onboard audio, interfa audio interface um, to go into narrow, narrow band transmitter. Um, and this will compress. I've got, I've got a sample on there. We can't get it to play on uh, Noel's laptop, unfortunately. I've got a sample here of some uh, H.264, which was encoded at 64 kilobits, and it's smallish. Um, it's qu it's quarter PAL size, um, but if we can get that into you know a couple of hundred kilohertz along with some reasonable audio. Um, then you know, we heard at the beginning of the day, where have we got primary, where are we primary user on the bands? And 10 meters. And so we've got the opportunity here for doing um, fast scan TV to you know, real DX like South America and stuff like that. Now wouldn't that be fun? So th there's definitely opportunities. And that was the clip, but it won't play unfortunately. Uh, so that's the end of the talk. Uh, I'll just plug outside. I've got my USB power meters available for anyone to get a demo of, and I've bought a few uh, for sale as well. Um, come and have a look if you're interested. Um, any questions on the talk? I was with you up until you mentioned FFmpeg. What is FFmpeg? It's a software package. Um, it's cross-platform, works on Windows, Linux, and Mac. Uh, I've got no idea. <laughs> I don't know what the FF is. It stands for the initials of the chapter right there. Yes, I think you're right. Okay, the second question. Can you remind us exactly what the difference is between a transport stream and a program stream? Um, program stream primarily relies... Uh, on the fact that it's the medium carrying it is uh, fairly lossless. Uh, tra transport stream is designed for lossy environments like over the air. Program stream is designed for 
where you've got a reliable uh, storage medium like a DVD. So you're not going to get dropouts and things like that. Uh, transport streams um, support multiple uh, video programs, multiplexing together. Program streams tend to be a single single video program. Don't think they have to be. But. And yet, <coughs> Jason, I like the idea of the HDMI. I see on all these all these little cameras that uh, have all got HDMI outputs, and right. uh, I guess at some point the PAL bit will disappear. So I look forward to that. Um, yeah, we, we, when we've been streaming from the um, round table, um, we've been using um, Firewire for the last, well, since we started five, five years ago or whenever it was. Um, but really, I did, we didn't want to invest in HDV stuff. thought that um, full HD was better, and then Firewire, so, uh, HDMI seems to be the so way to go. So that might be our typical picture input mechanism, whatever the output is later. Yeah. Uh, some crystal ball stuff. I mean, uh, with the things that you've been looking at and, and working on, might we expect, for instance, to be able to use some HD in four or six mega symbols, do you think, reasonable? Yeah, easily. Yeah. I, th I think he, um, it was really interesting what was said this morning about um, the release of a codec for the Raspberry Pi. Um, and also, we don't really have any information about what its capability is. Here, with the, with the codecs that are provided for those three different TI series chips, it gives clear performance figures on exactly how many frames a second you'll get with all the different MPEG profiles. It's all laid out in a table. So we know that if we plump for one of those, then we know exactly what frame rate we can get, how much bit rate, there will, and mean, then hence how much how much RF bandwidth? You mean we to use, use the Raspberry Pi or use the code that's embedded in it? Big one? You mean to use the Raspberry Pi or, or the, the code that's embedded in it? So I'm talking about if we c can we apply these techniques to Raspberry Pi to get the price down because I mean Leopard Board's 90, uh, 96 pounds or something and Raspberry Pi is considerably cheaper than that but we don't really know when they do, when they do offer that codec whether it will actually support our needs for, say, full HD. And we also don't have um, a good feeling about what the um, input feed that is. And we know that they're going to support, was it a 5 megapixel CCD module, but can we connect you know, an HDMI to something, converter on the front, to support our non-directly uh, connected CCD needs? So there's a lot of questions there. It would be really nice if we could, we could stand on that work, but... Any more questions? Well, Jason, thanks very much for that. Very interesting to see another different approach to uh, digital TV. Uh, can we share our appreciation in the usual way, please? Thank you.